Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you, Lebo, for the introduction and the invitation and for hosting me. Um, I'm coming from um, a more than week um, visit to the University of Free State and then Nelson Mandela University, where I, um, I had uh, similar opportunities to talk about decolonization uh, in uh, higher education in, in South Africa. So I hope that my uh, presentation today will make a minor contribution to the ongoing discussions that I know get often very heated and very sensitive um, around many, many issues. So I'm, I'm eager uh, in the end to, you know, hear your thoughts, your comments, your questions um, regarding the issues that trouble these particular settings because one of the uh, major points I want to make, and I say this from the very be beginning, is even the meaning and the manifestation of, of decolonization may have similarities with other uh, universities in South Africa, uh, South Africa, but you have to find your own definition and you have to discover uh, what it means in practice here in this setting because it might take a very different trajectory than um, other settings in, in other universities in South Africa. So, what is my point on, of departure? Um, Obviously, it, you know, the movements that you are very well aware, the roads must fall and fees must fall. Now, globally, uh, the issue of decolonization is, is, is not new. It's just has a new currency with these uh, movements in South Africa. But you will find it in, uh, by different names. You will read about the colonial turn, about the colonial thinking, and about the colonial gaze, just to mention a few. And I will clarify these terms very soon because I want, I want to be clear on some of the terms I will be using so that we are on the same page. Now, the colonial thinking is not new. It existed from the very inception of uh, modern forms of colonization. Uh, however, the more massive and possibly more profound shift towards uh, uh, decoloniality took place in recent decades and is still unfolding right now, especially with, with uh, the recent developments uh, in South African universities. Many people ask me some of these questions that I, I, I posed here from the very beginning. What does decolonization entail? It's not taken for granted that it has one particular meaning. And I will explain soon uh, what this implies. Why they need to decolonize? What are the challenges of decolonization? What are the limits placed on the decolonization forces, project by the forces of neoliberalism? Uh, many people ask me, is decolonization the same as Africanization? Or is decolonization the same as transformation? What is their distinction? Why do we need to make these distinctions? How does decolonization in curriculum and pedagogy take place? What does decolonization in higher education look like? And are there any tensions, complexities, or paradoxes emerging in decolonization efforts in higher education. Now, clearly, you don't expect me to uh, uh, provide responses to all of these questions, but I will try to at least touch on several of them. And here uh, is the structure of what I'm going to talk about to give you an idea of how uh, it's going to unfold. I will say a few things about the meanings of decolonization. Um, I will provide a brief journey through some of the colonial thinkers' ideas just to give us a couple of concepts that will be valuable in our discussion later. Um, I will touch on the issue of limits and risks because I don't think we should um, idealize 
decolonial thinking. It has its limits, and we need to be able to confront and discuss those limits as well. I, I will make the distinction between decolonization and Africanization, the same with transformation. Uh, and most of my uh, emphasis will be on the latter two points, decolonization uh, in higher education, the different approaches, especially emphasizing curriculum and pedagogy. And I will end with um, my summary so far of five fundamental shifts for decolonization that I think uh, need to take place in, in higher education. And this, this I, I mean, these five ideas are obviously in development, and I would uh, very welcome your suggestions how to enrich this, uh, this summary that I will provide in, in the end. So, let me start by uh, the notion of decolonization. Uh, it's a concept that takes on different meanings across different contexts. And going through uh, these kinds of discussions in various universities in South Africa, I see that firsthand. People mean different things by the concept of decolonization because each context, each setting has different needs and has different challenges to face. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot come up with some basic ideas. And in the literature, you will find a couple of basic principles uh, underlying this notion of decolonization. And here, I would like to share two of those. The first one is that it resists Eurocentrism and acknowledges the contributions of colonized populations across the globe. And the second one is that it emphasizes a moral imperative for righting the wrongs of colonial domination. It's an ethical stance in relation to social justice for those peoples enslaved and disempowered by persistent forms of coloniality. To put it differently, decolonization is interrogating how Eurocentric thought, knowledge, and power structures are implicated in the marginalization, exploitation, and exclusion of colonized people and groups, and it aims at reimagining modernity as a project of violent, epistemic, and territorial expansion to clear its past and point towards different futures. So you will um, hear me many times this afternoon um, making the argument that colo coloniality is very much entangled with modernity and capitalism. And this is a very important point to keep in mind because if we want to engage in, in, in decolonization, we have to imagine modernity and the project of modernity as a whole as well. Now, there are many names and the, uh, in, in, the, in the literature on decolonial thinking. Um, I have a few names here. It's impossible to go over all of their ideas, but I would like to give you a brief journey through four or five of them that I think are very uh, helpful in, 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 this, in, in this effort we engage to reimagine modernity. And they give us important intellectual tools in, in the discussion of the movements as well, Rose must fall and, and Fees must fall and the aftermath. So I will start with uh, Quijano. Uh, he is the one who coined the term coloniality of power by which he means a global hegemonic model of power in place that articulated race, labor, space, and peoples according to the needs of capital and to the benefit of white uh, Europeans. So you see immediately here the entanglement with capitalism uh, and exploitation of, uh, of, of uh, peoples. Coloniality uh, Kihano says, is a system that defines the organization and dissemination of epistemic, material, and social resources in ways that reproduce modernity's imperial project. This is done, for example, with 
uh, classification of races, the ongoing classification of races, a remnant of, uh, of imperialism and, and modernity. How labor is racialized for exploitation, especially of poor people uh, or of women. Uh, so if I had to put it like in a mathematical equation to simplify uh, the notion of coloniality, it would entail these three things. Speciality, the control of lands. Second, racism, elimination and subjugation of difference. And third, geopolitics of knowledge production, the epistemic violence that is done uh, by Eurocentric knowledge on all the other indigenous, local, southern knowledges. He makes, Kihano makes a, 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 an interesting uh, distinction between colonialism and coloniality. Not everyone agrees with this distinction, but I find it I find it valuable in thinking the terms and what they mean uh, in, uh, in today's world. He says that colonialism is a temporal period of oppression that has come and gone. So it's a historical period. Today, he says, we should speak about coloniality. We should use the term coloniality, the term coloniality. It's the underlying logic that places peoples and knowledge into a classification system such that all that is European is valorized, which is still very much with us today. So he says maybe it's more valuable to use the notion of coloniality rather than colonialism, which is associated with a particular historical period. As I said, not everyone agrees with it. Some people use it interchangeably. You will hear me using it interchangeably, but I find the notion of coloniality, especially coloniality of power, very valuable in, in theorizing uh, the system and its consequences. Another uh, the colonial thinker who, who is very well known is Walter Mignolo. And he talks about the colonial matrix of power and knowledge, which does not serve all humanity, but a small portion of it that benefits from the belief that in terms of epistemology, there is only one game in town, and that is the Western epistemology. And by saying that, I don't clearly imply that Western epistemology is monolithic. I don't want to run into the uh, problem of essentialism. However, there are some historical facts and realities in terms of Western epistemology, like the binaries that I will talk about later, that um, definitely make us uh, talk about uh, this hegemonic game in town, as Mignolo says. So coloniality and modernity go together. Modernity provides a rhetoric of salvation. We can see that this in uh, uh, efforts to convert uh, indigenous people to Christianity, so-called civilizing missions, or in contemporary discourses of development, especially from international organizations, uh, discourses of development in Africa. Those discourses, says Mignolo, they are, main, they are very much steeped in uh, discourses of modernity to modernize, to develop people, but deep down, uh, they're very colonial. So the decolonial the thinking aims at engaging in what he calls epistemic disobedience in order to envision social life, knowledge, and institutions differently. So we have to be disobedient to the Western project of epistemology if we want to engage in the colonial thinking, we have to challenge and dismantle the hegemony of Western epistemology. And what that entails, um, another a theorist who talks about decolonialism uh, um, in, in these terms is um, Buenaventura and de Sousa Santos from Portugal. Um, he talks about epistemologies of the South the unique epistemologies that have emerged from the South, highlighting in this manner 
that the South is not just a geographical, but rather an epistemic and political market, a source of unique knowledge emerging out of the experience of various forms of oppression. So epistemologists of the South, uh, argues Santos, have been consistently delegitimated, a process that he calls epistemicide, which means the murder of knowledge, the murder of Southern knowledge. Uh, another term that I find very valuable, especially in the context of higher education and, and, and decolonizing university, is his notion of cognitive justice, the recognition of epistemic diversity. And he argues that we cannot talk about global social justice unless we uh, talk about co cognitive justice, unless we promote cognitive justice, which is the recognition of Southern uh, epistemologies. So the project of social justice and the project of decolonization in higher education are very much entangled, says uh, Santos. You cannot separate them. You cannot uh, separate uh, the struggle for, for uh, global social justice from the struggle for global cognitive justice. Uh, Maria Lugones um, is an Argentinian um, uh, theorist who, who coined the term coloniality of gender and the analysis of racialized capitalist and gender oppression. She talks about uh, decolonial feminism, which is, which is distinguished from the more liberal form forms of, of feminism, and she argues that we need to talk about specifically uh, about uh, decolonial forms of, of, of feminism. Liberal forms of feminism are not satisfying if you want to dismantle uh, Western epistemology because liberalism is very much grounded in the Western project. So she says we need to recognize indigenous social structures and their relation to the land they constitute what she calls oppositional consciousness to colonial systems of sexual, ecological, and spatial hierarchies. And finally, a Jamaican uh, decolonial thinker, S Sylvia Winter, uh, she argues that colonization practices are entangled with the long history of Western imperialism and capitalism, and thus are reflected in knowledge production processes and institutions, including the university. So Winter puts forward a notion of humanness, not as an individual autonomous entity, but rather as a praxis. So she says being human is a praxis of humanness. It's not a concept, it's not, a, it's not an, autonom an individual autonomy. It's how you enact humanness that uh, gives you the name human. Knowledge is embodied and situated as raised and gender in marginalized and colonized settings, she says. So uh, she speaks about genre-specific modes of being human. And one of these genres is the Western genre of human. What is this genre of human? It's linked with colonialism as economic, cultural, and historical technologies of power that produced and normalized unequal racialized categories, making distinctions, these are the binaries now of the Western epistemology, between human or subhuman, have and have not, rational, irrational, male, female, and so on. Now, you might be wondering at this point, well, is there a possible way out of this mess and uh, Winter argues the solution is not to abolish humanism because some actually have been arguing we need to abolish humanism, move to posthumanist uh, formulations of, uh, of thinking and knowing. And she says that is not a solution. The solution is not to abolish humanism, but to reinvent it so that the consequences of colonialism are acknowledged and dismantled, and the knowledge production paradigm is reconceptualized. So I want to summarize what I've said so far in these five ideas 
that I think are the kind of recapitulation of what I've said so far, and we'll take it with us uh, in the uh, rest of the, uh, of the discussion. So the first one, Eurocentric knowledge has to be deconstructed and reconstructed to acknowledge the contributions of colonized populations across the globe. The second one is this entanglement between colonialism, modernity, and capitalism. The third one is social justice is inseparable from cognitive justice. The fourth one, coloniality still continues to deny the colonized and historically marginalized spaces to legitimate their own knowledge. Its implications, for example, in universities, need to be critically evaluated. And five, perhaps the most important, is decolonization is not an event, unlike many people might think. It's a process. It is not easy to achieve. It's, it's a long, painful, sometimes dramatic process, very challenging, but it's a process. So I think it will be naive to think that a single event, like a particular movement, would turn things around from one day to the other. Uh, and it reminds me of um, Habermas' famous quote, writing after, uh, in the aftermath of, of the Second World War and the Holocaust, he's saying there is not a single uh, liberation event that will liberate German society from the uh, toxic culture of Nazism. The detoxification process, he says, is a long process, and we have to be patient and strategic with it. And I will say more about this later, because I think it's very relevant to our work in, in higher education. Uh, so it's not an event. It's a process. Now, some risks. I would like to share two of them. There are many others, but I think these are very important risks. The first one is the colonial thinking runs the risk of essentializing complex knowledge formations, rendering a false dichotomy or moral evaluation between, on the one hand, good Africa. Now we assume the notion that you know, African epistemology is good, Western knowledge is bad. So what we do, essentially, we reinvent another binary from uh, Western thinking. So it's replacing one regime with another. And I think we should be careful about making those binaries, and especially essentialist binaries. The second one, it is more important, as some of our colleagues argue here in South Africa, to take African experience and theories seriously rather than claiming a uniquely African epistemology. Why? Because there are complex entanglements between knowledge formations. Knowledge formations are not isolated in a box. They do not happen in a, uh, in a vacuum. There is very much entanglement between different epistemologies. And there has been a lot of discussion, both in the sciences and the arts and humanities, in terms of this hybridity and entanglement between different knowledge formations. So I think it would be, um, it would be problematic to argue that there is pure uh, so-and-so knowledge that is isolated from a different formation. Decolonization versus Africanization. There has been a lot of discussion about this. Uh, I, I couldn't do justice in, in this lecture uh, by uh, offering you just one slide, but I think it's, a, it's an important distinction to make, especially in, re in reference to uh, Fanon and Nguki, who uh, wrote extensively, although meant very differently, the notions of Africanization. So decolonization is different from Africanization, and Fanon is very skeptical about this, uh, about the cause for Africanization, because he says they are haunted by the dark desire to get rid of the foreigner, and sometimes they have inverted racism in their argumentation. 
And Gugi provides a very different uh, notion of, of Africanization. He says, to Africanize is part of a larger politics of, no, of, of language, especially the mother tongue. So it's not an end point, but rather an ongoing struggle over what we should be teaching ourselves and our children in Africa. And this is an ongoing conversation, and you will hear, obviously, different people in different uh, settings arguing about what we should be teaching in, in, in this context. So the call for Africanization, according to Ngugi, is a project of decentering European knowledge and recentering knowledge according to African ways of knowing. Another big discussion that is going on is decolonization versus transformation. Some people argue that decolonization is actually a subset of transformation. Some people argue the other way around. Um, I'm not so sure. I haven't really, to be honest, uh, came up with uh, a convincing argument for one or the other. So I will give you both arguments. On the one hand, we have Jonathan Janssen arguing that transformation is a much broader and complicated uh, process than decolonization. And he brings into the conversation failing public schools, failing healthcare systems, corruption in government, and so on. So uh, the, the project of social transformation, he says, is a much broader and bigger than the project of decolonization. Um, on the other hand, there are others who argue that decolonization is at the heart of transformation. You cannot have any form of, of social transformation, in, at least in this country, if you don't engage in decolonization. So let me get now into the uh, more specifics of higher education. Uh, there are various di different approaches in decolonizing uh, higher education. I list here three by any means. They, uh, not, they are not mutually exclusive. However, for, um, I do those for, um, to distinguish in between their different foci. So the first one uh, focuses on institutional cultures. So transforming and disrupting the institutional cultures as they now exist, privileging neoliberal structures. The second approach is exposing the dominance of Eurocentrism in curriculum and pedagogy. And I will speak more extensively about this. And the third one is transforming, disrupting this dominance by pointing to knowledge possibilities that have been denied uh, relevance, like indigenous knowledge, African knowledges, local knowledge, and so on. Uh, let me start by decolonizing university structures. And I draw here uh, several ideas from uh, Achille Bembe and, and his article in, in 2016 and his more recent work. So he says, decolonizing the university implies a range of transformation. Many, many things need to take place. So it's not one thing. It's not only about the curriculum. It's not only about pedagogy. It's a lot of things that need to happen, starting from democratizing the systems of access and management, reversing the systems of authoritative control, standardization, classification, commodification, accountancy, and bureaucratization reflected in the organizational structures the teaching methods and assessment mechanism of students and faculty alike. And I have two quotes that are worthwhile to pay the, uh, attention to them. The first one is, he says, to decolonize implies breaking the cycle that tends to turn students into customers and consumers. And we hear many people talking about, cust about students as, you know, the university customers and the university consumers. And the second quote is, to decolonize the university is to reform it with the aim of creating a more open, critical, cosmopolitan, pluriversalist a task that involves the radical refounding of our ways of thinking and a transcendence of our disciplinary divisions. 
And you can see this in, in many uh, recent efforts by several universities in South Africa to get away from the traditional disciplinary divisions and engage in different interdisciplinary uh, fields or create uh, areas where people can actually collaborate interdisciplinary. Now, decolonizing pedagogy. I use here one of the most, um, of the earliest quotes from uh, Tejeda, Espinoza, and Gutierrez in 2003, one of the first definitions of decolonizing pedagogy. And they say, it must be guided by a conceptually dynamic worldview and a set of values that make it anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-homophobic. And um, I don't know if, if, you, if you noticed this, but in, in many instances, we, and I take the example of, of different uh, areas or, or disciplinary specializations in, in my field, like uh, my relevant fields, human rights education, social justice education, citizenship education, peace education. Many of these areas essentially have similar pillars and they, uh, they, uh, they have similar aims. However, for the purposes of disciplinary divisions, uh, many researchers are actually pocketed into one of these areas without studying, reading, or learning from the others. And so there is these this, uh, disciplinary pockets that are not informed by learning from other relevant uh, areas. So one of the uh, important ideas in decolonizing pedagogy is not to see it as another uh, disciplinary or another particular area that we have to uh, go uh, around to support it, but actually it's informed by already existing ideas. And it's not a matter of, of tracing the historical trajectories of one or the other, because if you really want to inform uh, from each other, you have to go into these different uh, uh, disciplinary areas. So they talk about this theoretical heteroglossia. Heteroglossia means different languages. There are different languages uh, that are being used, but at the end of the day, the project of decolonization, the project of social justice are very much united and very much follow uh, similar, if not the same trajectories. So decolonizing pedagogy draws from various, from, from various theoretical frameworks, post-colonial studies, critical pedagogy, critical race theory, black feminist theory, and so on, to name a few, so that educators and students are offered spaces and tools to recontextualize knowledge from non-Eurocentric perspectives. It recognizes and takes an active stance against the multiple ways in which knowledge production in the neoliberal order is implicated in the material conditions of coloniality and its persisting effects on understandings of education in higher education. And third, it provides educators and students the analytical and methodological tools for debating, challenging, and deconstructing inherited canons. Educators are called upon to play a central role in constructing the conditions for a different kind of encounter. So, at the end of the day, in decolonizing pedagogy, a social justice pedagogy, if you will, an anti-racist pedagogy, they aim at a different kind of encounter. An encounter that both opposes ongoing colonization and that seeks to heal the social, cultural, and spiritual ravages of colonial history. Now, if we move the discussion to the curriculum now, what it means to decolonize the curriculum, um, I want to share uh, three ideas. The first one is 
To liberate, it means to liberate the curriculum thinking from Cartesian binaries, the arrogant eye of Western individualism. And one idea would be, for example, to include Ubuntu philosophy interconnections with other human and non-human beings. But the point is not to simply uh, have what some theorists call an additive approach. Okay, you add a little bit of Ubuntu, you add a little bit of African epistemology, and we feel good about ourselves. Uh, but the center of knowledge still remains Western. Uh, I think what we mean here is to actually put them in conversation. It's not enough to add an additive approach is a naive way of dealing with the challenges we have in front of us. So we need to redesign curricula to include local epistemologies and rethink radically Western disciplines and their contents. For example, to include knowing through the pain, anger, and other experiences of colonial expansion and decolonization. I find the following three strategies by Subedi very valuable in decolonizing the curriculum. And I would urge you to actually find the article, it's in the uh, journal Educational Theory, where she has more extensive explanation what each of these strategies mean. Anti-essentialism, it critiques the monolithic portrayal of knowledge while emphasizing the value of recognizing not only the link between Western epistemology and modern decoloniality, but also the contributions made by the South. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's if you will, it's not only a pedagogical or curriculum stance. It, it's at the same time, admittedly, an ethical and political stance to engage in anti-essentialism. Contrapunal readings, it focuses explicitly on questions of colonization and imperialism. It doesn't put them aside. It doesn't pretend that they don't exist. A decolonizing curriculum historicizes the colonial and post-colonial conditions and their entanglements with power structures. And finally, ethical solidarity, it is attentive to how questions of solidarity have been conceptualized and it emphasizes the need to mobilize collective struggles across differences. I want to share a, a, a table here which I adapted from Vanessa uh, Andreotti uh, from an article in 2015 that I think provides a wonderful summary of the different um, stances we want to take towards decolonization in higher education from the uh, most naive uh, approach of everything is awesome, there is nothing wrong here, to the most uh, radical or beyond reform. And it's up to each university to put it now, to bring it down to the university, to decide the vision and the approach that they want eventually to, to follow. So we have at the uh, very beginning the, 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 the type of desire change, everything is awesome, so no change basically, no recognition of decolonization, and no decolonization practices whatsoever are going to be uh, enacted. Then we have soft reform. No recognition of decolonization as a desirable project, but inclusion of some other epistemologies into the mainstream. What I called earlier as an uh, additive approach. So you add a little bit of indigenous uh, knowledge as here, you know, uh, recognize that local knowledge of African uh, epistemologies exist, but deep down, the structures remain the same. Then we have radical reform. This is recognition of epistemological dominance. You name things by their name. And so how uh, we need to engage in, in decolonization? 
uh, and here we use the, um, the, the uh, understanding of social justice by Nancy Frazier. Recognition, representation, and redistribution. If you want decolonization, you need to offer recognition of alternative knowledges. You need to uh, provide uh, structures of representation for the marginalized. You need to redistribute resources, uh, not only economic, but uh, material and other resources. So empower marginalized groups and redistribute material resources. And then uh, Andreotti has a fourth category, which is beyond reform. This is the most beyond radical. Is dismantling of modernity's systematic violences, capitalism, colonialism, and racism, and its subversive educational use of spaces and resources. And um, here are some open ended questions that I think might help our conversation later. And I will just uh, let you uh, read those instead of uh, me uh, reading them. These are not easy questions, and obviously there are not easy answers. You know, how to challenge our dear social categories. It's not an easy thing for many reasons, for many reasons. So, to sum up, my five fundamental shifts for the decolonization of higher education. Number one. Awareness of decolonization is not enough. Its consequences must be exposed and challenged. Reject the discourse of deficiency. The dominant thinking in higher education in South Africa attempts often to understand student difficulties by framing students and their families as lacking academic and cultural resources. Acknowledge the socio-political context and its challenges and develop a strategic stepped approach to challenge colonized practices and structures. I know sometimes we might get impatient when there is no immediate change, but if we want to be strategic, we have to have a stepped approach, a step-by-step -step approach. You have to pick your battles. Some of them you might lose now, some of them you might insist and you should insist, but you cannot change. Decolonization will not happen overnight. Good intentions are not enough. You cannot be neutral. Neutrality amounts to perpetuating the status quo. And the final one, accept a loss of likability. You will make enemies, but you have to live with this. And I will leave you with two quotes, two of my favorite, one from Franz Fanon and the other one from Nguki. Just food for thought. And this is the end. Thank you. I'm not going to editorialize <laughs> as most academics will want to do. Because, yeah. So I will immediately take uh, comments. I'll take three at a time. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in my job as director of teaching and learning, uh, it's my obligation to initiate and support curriculum transformation in higher education. Um, and thus far, my experiences haven't been very encouraging. There seems to be an essentializing of what curriculum is mm -hmm. uh, 
largely to mean uh, cleansing the content. <laughs> and so I've tried to provide an expanded definition, a working definition of curriculum to include curriculum structure, that is the architecture of curriculum, curriculum content, uh, which has now become narrowly defined as decolonizing it, and the third dimension, which is uh, curriculum delivery, including pedagogy, mm -hmm. technologies, etc., etc. So, I, I like the notion of a stepped strategic approach. Uh, what advice would you offer me in what I'm trying to do to um, firstly redefine redef the terrain as you've done more broadly and more deeply, in fact, uh, but through a strategic approach that, in which we do curriculum rather than pontificate about it, mm -hmm. which is largely where the discourse is currently. What I'm concerned about a lot is how do you decolonize anything under conditions that make decolonizing anything very difficult? What I'm talking about is sort of the material conditions that we're working under. What you're proposing takes a lot of time time to engage, time to listen, time to allow depth to surface. But to me, one of the current conditions under which we function in this current context is that there is no time. In particular, time has been stolen. And, uh, you know, spaces are being dismantled with classes getting bigger, academics um, being more and more pressurized to do more and more things with less and less resources. Now, that to me is part of the operation of coloniality. How do you dismantle it when it disenables you from finding the spaces and times to dismantle it? Um, I'm wondering how can the ethical project start with self first and really to, un to understand mm -hmm. all the limits that, we, that are located here? Right. Because I just think otherwise it becomes a mimicry rather when you just see curriculum as a disembodied thing that I need right. to clean up and sort out and fix. Right. I think forgetting there's a person behind that or with that. And, and I really think, how do we use the ethical project in a strategic way to first understand what beliefs and knowledges limits our own understanding of, of who we are and what we should do? Yeah. I think that's the starting point because if we talk ethical, you've got to first understand. Mm -hmm. You have to take that ethical stance firstly to care enough to change. Mm -hmm. Change enough to change what? To change my thinking about something. That's right. And these, and this deep engagement that we need means that you really, you really need to ask yourself very, very risk-taking questions, and, and they're going to make you very vulnerable. And I don't take the point that we have to. We can't just change that curriculum. What is what is this thing we call curriculum? Aren't we in connected and embodied and entangled in that, in that curriculum, in, in, in this curriculum as doing, mm -hmm. in this curriculum as, as experience. Isn't that a living thing? Aren't we part of it? Shouldn't it start with us? And how then does the university space, how does, what spaces then get opened up where we can do it in a supportive way right. so that people don't feel that the whole floor is being pulled out from my mm -hmm. Because this is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. But in fact, what we are right now is dangerous. And it's bad. <laughs> so how do we, how do we, how do we do, we do that? Mm -hmm. Because we, we, want, we want to go to a, right. something that's good, that's socially just, that's ethical. And I think we need to feel that we care enough to do it first. These are excellent comments. I, th I find actually the three questions very much related. Um, yes, you have to start obviously from the individual. We are bodies, we are emotions, uh, and you have to challenge yourself. And this is not easy to do. Um, and, and there are different ways of doing it. I'm not going to tell you, you know, uh, obviously different places and different universities pick different ways. Um, there are universities and you need time to do that. You cannot do it without time. So if there are constraints such as time and space, then you have to find ways to uh, resolve those, those constraints and then have 
the spaces and the times, emotional spaces as well as real material spaces and time to actually engage in this kind of work. So you cannot rush decolonization. You have to have a space for it. You have to have retreats. You have to have meetings, many, many meetings where you set, you know, the issues, you know, openly and you discuss openly uh, the difficulties because there are many sensitivities. You know that firsthand. There are many sensitivities in different understandings of decolonization. People's comfort zones are pushed in many, in many ways. People's identities might be threatened in many ways. And you have to, to, to be able to do that, you have to have the time and the space. And there has been a lot of research, not in, in, in this area, but in general in education, that talks about if you want to have a reform, you have to have time and space for it. You have to have time and space for your colleagues to engage in these difficult discussions without rushing, but but some things need to, to write. Not, some things need to take their time to move on. And so that's why I, I'm, I've been saying and repeating all the time, each place will define its own decolonization project if it wants to engage in this project, first of all, because it might think of the consequences and so on. And then if the, if, if the answer is yes, and if the answer is yes, we want as a university to contribute to social uh, transformation, then you have to have a, a, an approach, a strategic approach. You have to lay out your priorities. You cannot do everything, you know, uh, from the beginning. Um, so other universities, for example, have been doing uh, frequent retreats or have given release time to their, to their faculty. So it depends on how you know, it depends on many things. How much commitment you have to engage in this project, how much resources you are able to gather. Um, so there are some structural conditions that need to be in place so that you as an individual and you with your colleagues will sit down and engage in this, in this difficult project. Uh, but I don't want to leave the impression that it's, um, yes, it starts from the individual, but we have to understand that we are talking about social structures here. So it's not, we should not blame the individual because this, this entails the danger of basically blaming the individual. If this fails, which it might, and you will face failures and you know, many, many obstacles, then the, the, the easy target will be the individual, and it's not the individual. It's the structures of the university, it's the structures of the society, and then the university can do so much because the society has, has its structures, and obviously there is entanglement. So in a sense, some people are arguing the, the university cannot even engage in a decolonization project, pragmatically speaking, if the whole society is not engaged in, in transformation. So one might build and the other might do exactly the opposite. So, um, so I guess I don't know if I'm answering your, your questions, but, but you have to set your priorities. Curriculum is not an empty content. It's the embodied curriculum. One of the things that I teach my students in, in the first, very first day of curriculum 101 is that curriculum there is a misperception that is this 40 pages of goals and aims and objectives and this is a great you know uh, misrepresentation of what a curriculum is curriculum is embodied curriculum is is how you enact the curriculum is not this you know this content that exists there it's 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 what you choose how you choose to deliver it, and um, with what consequences. Because sometimes we forget the consequences. There are implications in what we teach. We may not, we may evaluate a very small part of it, a final exam or a paper, but there are many more 
complex consequences that we don't measure necessarily or we don't pay attention to in terms of you know, uh, the delivery and the, and the implications of the curriculum. Just talking about the decolonization links both well, it's knowledge, but it's also a, it's a modernist project, it's a capitalist project, it's a neoliberalist. Project. Yes, yes. And I think almost in trying to, I, I don't disagree that it should embrace all of those things, but I think simply in the fact that it does makes it such a difficult thing to do yeah. because we just yeah. don't know what it is yeah. that we're trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> because. In a way, you know, when you think about fees must fall, I think very much there was a sense for many students it was, it was about access to higher education and about decolonizing knowledge. For staff, or as a, as talking as an academic, when I spoke to students, students obviously have no idea what it means to be an academic in a neoliberal mm -hmm. institution and how our lives have changed in the last 15 years. I've worked here for 20 years, so I've got quite a... You can, you, the, the work of an academic has become untenable, which students obviously don't see and don't understand, and that's the neoliberal uh, managerial. Right. Uh, so in a way, it's the same thing, Labby, <laughs> Ravi talking about, you know, yes, the university wants a decolonized curriculum, but they do not want an um, neoliberal institution. <laughs> they do not yeah. want to change the culture. Yeah. I mean, they have embraced that. Yeah. The, the UKZN says, uh, you know, and it's our particularly the reach things, what are respect, oh. what, 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 client-centered, which yes. I've been yeah, yeah, yeah. about for, since it was there, and it's never ever changed. So there we have it, we, we are supposed to be client-centered, and I say, who is a client? I don't have any clients. I don't know what that means. I teach students. Um, so I think when we engage with all of those things, it becomes really difficult yeah. as academics and as... Yeah managers of the institution as its, yeah. and as students because we all are experiencing this thing in such very different ways and students are wanting access of course to higher education almost in order to access the goods of capitalism mm -hmm. do they not want capitalism mm -hmm. i mean some of us you know what i mean it's it's kind of such it's so entangled because mm -hmm. Capitalism is the thing that offers these so jobs in this, that, right, that students need access to yeah. in order to yeah. get out of poverty and in right. order to do that you need to, you know, so it's just so many layers and I think we just don't know what are the structures that we really want to uh, just want to make fall and, and which, are, which ones are we actually able to, to engage because almost when it becomes this huge thing like I'm going to tackle mere liberalism. You cannot tackle the education. <laughs> so what, you know, so it's kind of that idea of, uh, you know, what do we do as individuals, as academics, as groups of academics, as students, and how do we also talk, I think, so much. For me, it would, in this whole thing, we don't often talk that academics understand what students are saying and students understand what we experience as academics, what it actually means, mm -hmm. what the university now expects us to do right. is actually impossible. Mm -hmm. okay. It is impossible. I wouldn't um, say it's. I wouldn't say it's impossible. But you're no, but you absolutely know, you right. Yeah. No, yeah. Is, yeah. What I mean is that the managerial performance management stuff that we work under, if you accept it, becomes untenable in the. I mean, the way this institution has engaged. With it. But That's but if you start, you yeah. No no no. These are very good thoughts. If you start from the assumption that it's impossible to change course, things, then. Conversation ends. We, we don't need to be here. No, I'm, I, I get what you say. So, so this is my point. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. It's all of these things, you know, and, and different, you know, from the perspective of the, of the faculty and the perspective of the, of the students, there needs to be better communication. There needs to be better, you know, um, joining of forces in, in, in struggling against some of the things that you mentioned. But obviously, there are all of these things. And as I said at the beginning, and one of my points was, you have to set your priorities. You cannot fight the system. This is, like a, this is, this is very vague, you know, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is not something vague. It's in the practices that you experience and you describe very well. So you set your priorities. And you said, you know, you have a very um, thoughtful strategy with your colleagues 
that you will tackle one, two, three, and, I, and, and you have a rationale for this. Why you go first for one, second, and the third? Not, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah, I feel this or I feel that. You have a very thoughtful approach. You do your homework. You study the, the challenges, the obstacles in context. That's why it's a contextual process. And then you say, well, for this year, my goal will be this modest you know, uh, change at the micro-political level. I cannot change the neoliberal culture of the Western, you know, uh, capitalism. That's impossible. But, but if we start from that position, then there wouldn't be anything we would do. So you, you, you start small, modest, realistic, pragmatic goals, and you have, but you have a stepped approach. You have the vision in your mind, and you, you set uh, realistic goals. I, I don't think, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't think of anything else like to, to offer you at this point because I agree with you. I agree with you. It feels so overwhelming that sometimes you even have difficulties prioritizing because you see, well, well uh, they're equally important, so, but you need to make choices. I've got two questions, if not three. The first one is is on the issue that we have once indicated, saying that decolonization, in order for decolonization, decolonization to occur, we have to be colonial disobedient. So my question is, how then we as academics? You indicated that for us to attain the, 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 the construct of decolonization. We have to be colonial disobedient. So my question is, we as academics, how then can we, what measures can we do in order to be disobedient? In, the, in, the, in your everyday life, in your academic life, in your, in your classrooms, in your, yeah. That's my first question. So my, my second question is on the issue that you've indicated that decolonization is a process. So if I could ask, do you think we as the University of Wazulu-Natal, have we started the process? And if we have started the process, when do you think will it end? Well, you tell me if, if you start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I just came today. <laughs> you have to tell me whether you think it has, it, it has started. All right, thank you. <laughs> then the last question is on the... The idea that you have just displayed in one of your articles indicating the issue of reconceptualizing the, the, the issue of public goods. Yes. Invested into the issue of public goods. So do you think that, that reconceptualizing the university cities into public goods is one of the strategies that can be able to attain the, the decolonization? Very good point. Yes. Thank you. I start from the, th from the third one. Yes, we need to rethink the purpose of, of education as a public good in higher education. And, um, and that entails, you know, that's part of, of the decolonization proce process that we need because, because what our colleague mentioned earlier with the neoliberal structures of the university, the university is going in other directions that they are not satisfying to any of us. They're not satisfying to the students as well because they pay, the, they pay also the price of uh, our dissatisfaction and the difficulties that the faculty uh, experiences. So, um, so there, I mean, there are many ways of, of tackling this. Uh, faculty uh, activism, you know, is one of the ways writing about it, uh, engage in lobbying, um, I mean, these, are, these are the ways that you can try to change people's uh, perspective. But, but as, as, as a faculty member in my classroom, I, I shared a couple of, of strategies like, for example, not taking an essentialist position or bringing, enriching your curriculum and bringing southern knowledges that have been, I mean, it's impossible for me to teach in a South African university and not have African philosophers in the curriculum. And I've heard this many times, like there's, there's philosophy 101, and all of the philosophers are like Western philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and all the others. Fine, 
do Plato, do Aristotle, do the, uh, the philosophers of nature, but also there are many philosophers you know, in Africa and many African epistemologists who talked about similar things. So you can, you can bring them together and discuss the different knowledges and the different traditions together and bring them in conversation. So you cannot ignore you know, the local indigenous uh, African knowledges and have a curriculum that is totally focused on, uh, on Western philosophers. This is the most naive example I could give you. But also, I pay a lot of attention in the pedagogies used in the classroom. So it's, it's how you perform yourself. It's whether you give the space for, for difficult questions to, to come up or whether you tell the students to shut up at the end of the day because they make you feel uncomfortable or because you don't know the answer. Yeah. You know, I said many times, I don't know. I don't know this. You know, you, this is an excellent question, but I don't know the answer. Uh, we need to work it out together. Let's think about it together. So it's this, it's this anti-essentialist uh, stance that brings people together. If you pretend that you know everything, which is not true, you will, uh, not only you will ridicule yourself, but also um, you will not have at the end of the day, I think an ethical or, or, or political stance to talk about change because you consider yourself as the source of, 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 of uh, correct knowledge, of uh, true knowledge, which is the remnant, again, to go back to the colonial uh, traditions. It's a remnant of the I, of, of the Cartesian I. I hold the knowledge. I will give it to you, the student who knows nothing. So it, it's a lot of things, like, like, like you said earlier. It's a many things that need to happen at the, at the level of curriculum, pedagogy, and, and several other things. But set your priorities. You cannot change all of it in one day. You said uh, decolonization is, um, is a process, yes. uh, which, is which is maybe a very long process. Can we decolonize within a society that is not transforming? I'm thinking of other universities where there are interest groups that are very strong. Yeah. For instance, Agri Forum, for instance. They are very, very strong in certain universities and they would want maybe to keep the status quo in most cases. Can we, if, if, the, if society, because I'm thinking university like it's, we're in isolation, we are moving ahead and leaving society behind, can we? Um, if, if your answer is no, then again the conversation ends there. There is nothing you can do. You say beforehand, hands up, I cannot do anything. It's very difficult. It's, you know it. It's very difficult. If, if one goes into one direction and you know, society goes into another, there has to be some kind of collaboration. So the university would do very well if it collaborates with the local society to form a common vision, the community around it, a common vision that could be promoted. But if they're going into different directions because of of power struggles because of the power interests, uh, group, different uh, interest groups, uh, alumni and so on that want to take the university because supposedly they give money or not. If you don't fight these things and if you don't, and I, I mean I know VCs in South Africa who chose to battle some of this with various results, some of them successfully, some of them very unsuccessfully. Um, but, but there is no other way, you see. There, is, uh, there has to be some kind of, of uh, uh, collaboration. Otherwise, you might end up making it an extremely long and frustrating process. And when it's becoming so long and you don't see changes, then you either give up or... Uh, or, you know, I mean, you become very frustrated and then other problems begin. Uh, I just want to refer to the notion of uh, your strategic step approach mm -hmm. and the fact that 
we at the university, uh, together with uh, Rabbi's office, uh, are looking towards um, approaching staff and, and groups of um, people involved in uh, recurriculating. And the challenge that I personally face is that, or, or maybe I should say it's easier for me to go to people in humanities, in education and so on, and have a conversation about uh, decolonizing the curriculum. My challenges are within uh, areas of science and maths and mm -hmm. computer science and so on. So I would like your view on that. Well, I had the same uh, kind of conversation yesterday at uh, NMU. And uh, um, there were people from uh, chemical engineering and computer science uh, basically asking me the same, the same kind of questions. And these are, these are conversations that need to take place in, in those departments as well. But I think uh, if, if I had to advise you of something, and, and I know because our good friend and colleague Andre Kitt who's been appointed by the Minister of Higher Education to uh, uh, run this um, transformation in higher education process. Um, he started doing uh, these retreats with, with universities, and I think you have to prepare a strategic plan for it, for transformation. So he, what, he do, what he does basically, he, he brings people together, and he has like a... Um, a three-day, two, three-day uh, seminar or retreat where people, there, there is a particular procedure, and you see it in many workplaces. You, you outlining the different meanings, understandings, challenges, and visions, and then by the end of this workshop, of this how many days workshop, you come up with specific strategies of how you want to move with a common agenda and a common vision and a common understanding. So there are ways of doing it. It's just, again, goes back to Dorothy's question. Um, uh, do you have the time? Do you have the resources? Do you have the institutional support to do it? Because difficulties will always be existing, either disciplinary difficulties, epistemological difficulties, political difficulties, and so on. The question is, do you have the commitment to address those questions and, and to find the ways? And there are people, there are colleagues, there are various ways of actually that you can organize and do this in ways that you know you confront the challenges and the obstacles instead of putting them under the carpet so my question first would not be whether computer science is more difficult because there are ideas of enriching the curriculum with courses that actually do this. Yes, I know uh, if you teach uh, C++, for example, um, there is not much you can do, but there are many ways of teaching it differently according to the strategies that I mentioned, or including a course on the, uh, epistemolo on the philosophy and epistemology of science that does justice to the diversity of knowledge. Uh, so, so to see the consequences of you know, capitalist, of choices to go into the workplace and, and have the goods of capitalism, there are consequences. Do we discuss with our students these consequences? Do we have the space to, to do this? So there are ways of enriching the curriculum of enriching, but I think it starts from how willing, first of all, if you have the commitment, the political commitment of doing so, and if yes, if you can find the resources and the practical ways of doing so. And I think the first sometimes is more difficult than the second. Uh, I just like to, uh, I think uh, uh, I just heard what Tully had to say, and I'm just thinking I'd like to add another dimension to time and space that while our institutional culture promotes a very individualistic, competitive, dangerously competitive environment. I think collaboration, when you talk collaboration, you're talking collaboration, not just social sciences, you're talking collaborative, creating a collaborative culture in the university where humanities talks to the sciences. Mm -hmm. 
where we and that's uh, that's part of the decolonizing yeah. project. The, the problem why it won't work is we work in silos, right? Because we're working with divide. Let's control each one uh, in very separate units, and I think that's where we're losing the plot. We're talking against. We can work relationally if you work as a collaborative. I think I think that basis needs to change. We were, we were stuck for many years where we were competing with our neighbors, competing with the person in the next office. Firstly, and then we're competing with faculties in every kind of way. I think those are systemically what needs to shift. It's a very good point. Um, you gave us a great idea about how to incorporate, um, you know, balance the thinking from the South and um, in terms of looking at epistemology and those sorts of things, and that's really helpful. I just wanted to ask from your own experience in your classroom, how did you manage to get or push the boundaries with assessments um, in terms of this whole discourse? You mean with different kinds of assessments approved by the university? Yeah, or, or, your, or how did you get around kind of like that part of, of, of engaging with your students? Um, or how did you push the boundaries in terms of the whole decolonization uh, give me give me a, a, examples of what kinds of assessments you use here so that I, I, I get an idea. Uh, we would use anything from uh, your um, standard um, multiple choice questions uh, to essays to um, reflection pieces and peer reviews um, that would be the stand exams uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Have you used like uh, collaborative projects? Group work and collaborative projects, um, action research. Yeah. So there, there are, I mean, there, there are different ways of dismantling this traditional uh, testing or final testing. But you have to 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 um, make allies within your department and within your university to push for the agenda of alternative assessments because there are many traditional views. In my university, there have been many traditional views that assessment only consists of multiple choice tests and final exams. This is, this was, so we have to fight a lot of us and provide you know, uh, alternative ways of assessment, and eventually we we um, we got the space for it. But it took us it took us a number of years, uh, and now we have collaborative projects. As I said, we have action research where students go out and study a particular problem that they face, not something theoretical that we give them, but actually a real life problem. They take interviews, they talk to people, they, uh, they do the cycle of the action research and they come back and write a report or bring people in the classroom and present, do presentations. So there are ways of dismantling this traditional percep perception that you will be successful in the classroom if you're able to reproduce the answers in the multiple choice or in the answers of the final exams. And we started from simple things, 5 10% at the beginning, and now we, we managed to have almost 50% of the, of the grade uh, at my university to be determined by, by these alternative ways of assessment. Uh, you've achieved the outcome of complexifying and deepening our understanding of curriculum, our conceptions, our misconceptions. Uh, of course, one of the hazards of complexification is that it can lead to paralysis. Where do you start with this mass of what needs to be done? Where do you begin? So I, I want to return to what I said earlier. Um, we, we use a key, shall I say, intervention or driver as a way of entering the field and then systematically and progressively in a step approach addressing the complexity. And that is to address the structure, the curriculum structure, institutional culture, but through an evidence-based approach. If we, if I commit, and, and, and I'm committed, and I'm making that declaration publicly, I am committed to supporting change. And I'm also committed to finding funds, the resources that we talked about, I'm committed to finding funds to initiate this drive and to support it to the extent that I can. <coughs> and I'm envisaging a very simple starting point. 
that is to engage interdisciplinary teams of researchers in each of our colleges to look at the curriculum structure. Why are we perpetuating a 400-year-old model, the Oxbridge model, in the three-year programs, the four-year programs? What's the, log what's the continued logic behind the credit accumulation model where you <coughs> assemble individual credits which you will never use again because in the workplace you expect to work collaboratively and in an interdisciplinary way. Why should a program be structured in the way that it is with X number of modules which you acquire in X period of time, otherwise you face expulsion or other failure you. What would an alternative curriculum, a decolonized curriculum structure? I don't have the answers to that. But I'm sure we, there is potential for some innovation, some alternative envi envisionment and possibilities. And that's my proposal. If, if you say, yes, this is something we want to do, um, I'll send out a call through your deans of teaching and learning. Um, and let's see where this goes. And of course, my sec second proposal is uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to harness the energies and the wisdom of this group an expanded curriculum and expert curriculum advisory group. One executive down. <laughs> How many more to go? <laughs> <laughs> so we are winning. Um, join me in thanking <laughs> our visitor. And thank you for coming, especially those people who came all, all the way from Peter Marit. <laughs> thank you.